Good evening, and welcome to uh, Chasing the Facts. This evening we have with us Mr. Mark Baranski, or should I say Vice President Mark <laughs> Baranski you. from Trammell Crow. <laughs> Trammell Crow is the development uh, company that is interested in uh, constructing uh, residential units on our West Campus property in Chelmsford. So we have Mark here with us this evening to kind of give uh, Chelmsford residents a little bit of a flavor as to what they are proposing for the unit, uh, for the uh, land, excuse me. And uh, so we'll just get right into the discussion. And what we do, Mark, uh, when we start off, we uh, generally ask the guests to give a very brief biographical sketch. So if you just sure. do that for us, yeah, and then we'll get into the discussion. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate your time. Uh, so my biography, uh, I have been involved in the built environment probably since I was um, uh, at least 18 when I was started working construction summers out of college. Uh, I segued into a commercial construction firm, worked there for quite a while. While I was doing that, uh, I was fortunate to um, have moved to the south end of Boston, which was kind of in the midst of a, of a renaissance, and, um, and there were some opportunities to pursue uh, development there with brownstones, and so I would you know, work during the day at my construction company, and in the evenings, I'd, weekends, I'd be gut rehabbing uh, brownstones in the south end. And uh, that, so I got to a point in early 2000, 2000s where I said, boy, I, I think I like the real estate a little bit more than the construction part. Um, I uh, went and did a graduate real estate uh, finance program at MIT, uh, and then, uh, dove back into the, the real estate world on a full-time basis. Uh, built office structures, residential structures, storage structures, uh, assets from Dallas to Boston, uh, all over the place, Baltimore, Washington, D.C. Uh, so I've seen quite a bit. I've seen big projects, I've seen small projects. Um, I love the, the challenge and the um, the, the, just the, the puzzle solving, the problem solving that comes in real estate development. It's, it's, a, it's a challenging environment and you know there's no easy answers. It's a very collaborative environment with, um, with your butters and neighbors, with your consultant team, with the town, town and city administrations, and you really have to work and come up with solutions to try and make people happy. Well, that's great, and it sounds like you have a very good background, and what I like particularly is the fact that you actually have hands-on experience. You understand something about the construction field and how things have to be built and fit into various uh, scenarios and so forth, so that's pretty good. Um, before we get into the discussion, I do want to take one second to just give our viewers a little bit of a snapshot as to the history of this uh, particular property that we're talking about. And I'll be very uh, brief. Um, in 1898, uh, the Middlesex County Truancy School was established. And uh, that was put on the property. And that was a reform school where you send uh, young men who uh, were uh, charged with various infractions of the law and so forth, as opposed to sending them to prison. So you'd send them to a reform school. And uh, that operation went on for many years. Uh, it was closed down in February of 1973 uh, as a result of investigations that were done uh, relative to how the uh, kids at the school, were, at the reform school, were being uh, treated. And the allegations were that they weren't being mistreated. Mm -hmm. So as a result of that investigation, they shut the, the, uh, they shut the operation down. And then Wang Laboratories, uh, acquired the property because they thought this is a good place for us to put our corporate headquarters. And as most people in the area know, Wang decided not mm -hmm. to do that. They built the, uh, the tower suite uh, on the Chelmsford uh, Lowell line on Chelmsford Street. So in 1984, Wang said, we'll donate the property to UMass. So they did that. And then UMass uh, used that uh, uh, area and the facilities for their graduate school of education and they did that for about 20 years. Uh, the problem is that uh, the buildings themselves were not in particularly good repair and uh, in some cases they were deemed unsafe and also uh, in terms of proximity to the balance of the UMass cameras it was considered to be inconvenient for the students so in uh, the early 2000s uh, 
Bob Hogan, who was the chancellor at the time, said, you know what, it's time to get out of this area. We're going to move everybody back onto um, uh, South Campus. So they did that. Uh, so pretty much the area, the buildings were vacated. Uh, the, uh, and in 2013, we had a fire. That building was demolished. And then in 2015, the last building that was being used, uh, which was the Robert F. Kennedy Center, was vacated in 2015. So from 2015 up until about a year ago, the buildings were, were vacant. They weren't being supervised. They were subjected to all kinds of vandalism. And then the normal deterioration that you would expect uh, mm -hmm. to occur from, uh, as a result of not being maintained. So in uh, 2018, the legislature finally authorized the sale of the West Campus property. So that's just a little bit of the history of the property. So. Um, Perhaps uh, you could give us um, a brief overview of what you envision this project to be. Sure, sure, I'd be glad to. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's anyone who's walked the site or driven around it, it's a lovely, lovely piece of land. It has some interesting topography. It has uh, some you know, very important wetlands. So it's really a, a fascinating piece of land. Um, our vision has always been to, to try and leave untouched the areas that have been untouched and those areas that were already occupied by roads and lawns and structures those were the areas that we'd like to mm -hmm. put the housing on and and that's that's kind of a you know that kind of makes sense to try and not touch things you don't have to touch and 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 then disturb the things that are already disturbed um, we started uh, uh, working with the uh, the successful bidder to the asset a, a couple years back. Um, spent quite a bit of time uh, deriving a site plan and a massing plan, which is what we do, to just kind of figure out where things will fit. Um, and uh, you know, I think then we came in at rather early stages and had conversations with the town and some. Uh, some members of the uh, select board to sort of show our ideas and what we thought we'd like to see and whether that seemed to be something that made sense for, for the town. Um, the give and take between the town and the abutters and, and our consultant teams has been uh, an ongoing process for you know well over a year now and it's been it's been very valuable um, we can't know what people's concerns or priorities are until we actually speak with them um, I don't live in the area uh, I live in the city and so coming up here I have my assumptions but it's really great when we get feedback from people who who've lived near the site who know its history uh, who really care about it and and that's really helped evolve our program and make for what I think is a much better proposal mm -hmm. for the project. So, you know, the, where we're at now is 340 units of housing that will be developed by Trammell Crow Residential. It's a mix of different housing typologies. There'll be some uh, four-story structures. There'll be uh, some townhomes. And then we're working with Choice, Chelmsford Housing Authority's entity, uh, and allocating a piece of land for them to build 54 age-restricted um, and also uh, affordable units mm -hmm. for the benefit of the town. So in the end, it's about 394 units. Uh, again, with a kind of different, different massings and sizes and and view lines that we think uh, really work with the topography of the site. And, and that's a very good snapshot. I I've been in town now for 40, almost 43 years, and I've been involved in the in the town administration for about. Uh, 25 plus years in various capacities, and I can't remember uh, a time when we had a development proposal in conjunction with the Chelmsford Housing Authority. I don't recall that we've ever done that before. Usually the, uh, the um, developments that the Housing Authority does are standalone. Mm -hmm. And I don't, and, and you know, I'm sure somebody will call me and tell me if I'm wrong, uh, and, and I hope they do, and then I'll make a retraction <laughs> at a later time. But I just don't remember. This is this is an interesting concept, and um, you've been working with Dave Hedison and the Housing Authority, yeah. and he's, and you probably have learned that he is uh, one of the most knowledgeable people in the yeah. state in this particular area. I mean, yeah. this guy can tell you things that you never even dreamed of relative to uh, um, the type of housing that he builds. And um, so I think that's a, that's a very interesting aspect of this. Now in terms of your butter uh, 
conversations, outreach, and so forth. Uh, how did that work? Did you seek them out? Did they come to you, or was there a combination? Uh, maybe you could explain. It was kind, it was kind of a combination. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I think uh, based on our early meetings with uh, town management administration, uh, the feedback was, you know, you really need to get out there and start talking to people. Here's some people that have attended prior meetings that have an interest in the property. So, so actually, it was some of the, the town officials that suggested that you do that. That in concert yeah. with our research. Yeah. I good. Mean, we certainly. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we certainly, um, uh, you know, Googled uh, prior, you know, mm -hmm. explorations <laughs> of the project to see what other people had been thinking about, right. and and that gave us a little bit of a roadmap. It gave us a starting point. Good. Um, and uh, you know, from there, you know, we started having some meetings, uh, you know, some conversations with the butters, and again, that was it's 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 such an important part of this process. In order to in order to build something that you know really works for the community, works for the immediate uh, abutters and neighbors, works for us as a developer, you need to have that collaborative process. You need to get feedback, mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it started, I think, with you know, with a couple people, a couple conversations, and then it really grew from there. Hey, you should really have a chat with this person. Hey, do you, do you know you know do you know what this person's concerns are? And it, it really it really expanded from there. Um, we then started a, a series of. Um, joint select board, planning board presentations, just kind of giving them updates on where we thought we were, where we, where, we, where the direction was going, and um, and the direction, and that was probably in late spring, early uh, summer of this year, the direction was, you know, you really need to get out and make sure you're, you've canvassed the entire community. So in late, uh, in July and August, we had a series of three public meetings that were um, very kindly hosted at the Meadowood uh, Clubhouse because it's probably the easiest place mm -hmm. to, to get to. We were met with Meadowood Butters, Windermere Butters, Whiteman Street, Princeton Street, pretty much everyone. We, we did a series of mailings based on the... Were uh, those well attended? Yeah, those were very well mm -hmm. attended, yeah. And again, you know, you know, you think you know everything about a project and then somebody says, hey, did you know about this? Did you know that this is a concern? Did you know that, you know, we're worried about this? And, you know, I can't say that I do. Because, I, you know, I mean, we don't know everything and that's that's why we need to be in the field talking with people. Um, those uh, those kind of group meetings, which you know had 40, 50, 60 uh, uh, attendees plus my entire consultant team explaining what we're doing, um, that then evolved into uh, more granular meetings, where we were able to speak with um, people one on one, people who attended meetings and really wanted to talk about very specific concerns for their home um, or people that couldn't make those meetings but really wanted to connect. Mm. Uh, and since then, you know, we've. I, Boy, I, I don't know if hundreds is the right number, but it's it's an awful lot of meetings with an awful lot of people. It's been great. Um, actually, I enjoy this part of it. It's, I like meeting people. Um, done those with uh, with with our landscape architecture team uh, to kind of talk about view lines and buffers and things that people tend to worry about. They worry about views. They worry about light. Uh, those are things that you know. Usually, we can get solutions via landscape and, and our regular architecture. Mm -hmm. And I think just from watching <coughs> some of the meetings that you cited, the the public meetings that have been held uh, concerning this project, uh, those issues have come up, and uh, you get the sense from your interaction with the select board and the planning board and, and other town officials uh, that the town itself feels that you've done your due diligence up to this point, you get that feeling? I certainly hope so, I, I, mm -hmm. I do. Um, you know, I, I mean, I would say if anyone's out there right now that's listening and they haven't heard from me and they want to speak to me, please, you can find me, I'm, I'm out there and maybe I can somehow put my uh, contact information out there. But we want to talk to people. Okay. We need to hear from people in order to respond to their questions and concerns we can't guess. Uh, but I think the town, I would say, I think the town's happy, this, this is, been a, a, a very concerted effort. We put in an awful lot of time uh, to reach out and meet people. So if it weren't for Trammell Crow <coughs> coming in to develop this property, uh, realistically, what other kinds of development uh, could go there? Uh, and in discussing that, perhaps you could give a little bit of an opinion on whether those kinds of other developments might benefit the town or might be uh, more adverse. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the in-place zoning is for single-family residential development, and um, you can build about 22 single-family homes. Mm -hmm. And um, as I, th I think you and others may have heard at some of our presentations, um, the school child impact from that many single-family homes is not terribly far off from what our school ch child mm -hmm. impact will be. Um, the big difference, obviously, is in the uh, real estate tax revenue. Uh, 22 homes is not going to be uh, deriving a lot of real estate tax revenue compared to our project. So it's probably a net negative uh, for single family housing as a cost to the town and an impact to the schools. Um, the other issue, which I think is kind of important to bring up, is you know, is we, we really work and partnered with David Hennison to incorporate this choice project because that was, we were told, was one of the most pressing needs in the town mm -hmm. is to create housing, uh, affordable housing for elderly Ab residents. Absolutely. And um, 22 single family homes won't accommodate uh, that. They just won't because it absorbs all the land. Um, similarly, some of the other potential uh, developments that could be there, commercial developments, uh, those can't accommodate that need either. So uh, the nice thing about this project and the way that we've approached it is that it's kind of tailor-made to respond to uh, the very specific needs of the town. Mm -hmm. um, even a 40B project, um, which would require 25% affordable, but it can't be age-restricted. So then you can't have the type of community that Choice wants to build. And so those are kind of the, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting that the, the housing choice law allows you to sort of tailor-make your approach mm -hmm. to the community and its needs. Uh, it's it's from all from all of the possibilities and the fact of the matter. This is just my opinion now, speaking as an individual and knowing a little bit about how these things work. Uh, if not Trammell Crow, that property will be developed somehow. I, it will be developed somehow, whether it's single family. I mean, which is the current zoning, obviously, so there wouldn't have to be much of a change for that. But that's too much developable land in the town of Chelmsford to not eventually be developed is what I'm saying. It will be developed somehow. <laughs> if I, if so, I step away as my, from my role as, right. as someone at Trammell Crow and I speak to you as um, I teach real estate finance at Northeastern University, so as an academic. My, my alma kinda. mater, and we won't, oh. say, we won't say what year. <laughs> Go Huskies. Yeah, yeah um, absolutely. Uh, uh, that is a, 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 an exceptional piece of land, mm -hmm. and it will absolutely be developed. Yes, I just you know, not not as Mark from Trammell Crow, just as somebody who's been in the business for thirty plus years, it'll be developed. Mm -hmm. And so, really, it's how do you develop something that is optimal for everyone, that really gets everything that the town needs and wants, and the butters need and mm -hmm. want, and certainly that the developer needs and wants. And we think <clears> we've kind of we've kind of hit the nail on the head. Well, let's let's hope that's true, and uh, let's let's go back a little bit to what you said about the uh, impact on the school system. I find that very interesting, and that's something that actually I've been asked about. Uh, I'm a, uh, as you know, I'm an assessor here in town, mm -hmm. and uh, I've had four or five people ask me about uh, the tax impact of this particular property. So I do, I took a look at, at the numbers, and I made some comparisons with other large uh, rental. Uh, <coughs> Uh, properties in town just to see where we were because I had heard at the last select board meeting there was an estimate that this project would generate approximately uh, between 1.2 and 1.3 million dollars a year in tax revenue. Uh, so and then of course we had the uh, the alternative of for example the 22 uh, housing uh, units which would probably have uh, generated about a quarter of that revenue. Okay. That's correct, yeah. So, so that's important in terms of, of impact of the community, in terms of community services, which most likely would be more heavily weighted towards the schools. That would, is where the expense would be. So, and just, and I won't go through all the details, but I'm going to ask people to trust me as, a, as, a, as an assessor that I do understand how to do this, okay? I went back and I looked at the numbers, and uh, on a per unit basis of value, uh, potential value generated and revenue generated, I find that your $1.2 million estimate is actually pretty accurate. I'm not going to hang my hat that that's the exact number, but I would certainly say it's, it's, it's going to be between $1 and $3.5 million annually in tax revenue. I think that, that's a good ballpark. 
and uh, that number would cover about 55 school children at an $18,000 a year per student cost, just as a frame of reference. And again, these numbers are not absolute, but it's an indication. So I think uh, uh, with, if your projections are accurate on the number of students, I think this, at, at the very least, will not be a financial drain on the community. And I think that's what people are concerned about. Right. Okay. And it could very well turn out to be a financial positive for the community. The potential is there. So I think it's important for people to understand uh, uh, that uh, aspect uh, of, of, the, uh, of the impact. So, um, and I'm sorry I didn't mean to take so much of your time away no, from you, but I think that's an important fact. Uh, the other thing uh, that you hear all the time on any kind of a project, whether it's uh, not so much residential, but of course this is large residential, but uh, certainly on commercial. And we had this, uh, we had this uh, concern, uh, one of our recent developments that was done in the center of town, Grist Mill. People are concerned about traffic impact. So can you talk a little bit about what you found in that area? Sure, sure. And, and I will, I'll put out the caveat that I'll always defer to the, our consultant and professionals mm -hmm. in this field. Uh, it's not my area of expertise. Um, the feedback from our traffic consultant indicated that during kind of prime travel hours, which I think I characterize as 9, uh, 7.30 to 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. and call it 4 to 6, but I could be off on that, um, that this project would create about one car a minute leaving the property on average. Between um, the early morning hours and the evening. So in that, in that call that 90 minute Basically, commuter hours. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So in that 90 minutes, uh, from call it 7:30 to uh, to nine, we create about 90 additional cars of traffic, approximately. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, um, the projection was they probably go um, equally either way as they leave the property. So you, it's arguably, it's one car every two two minutes mm -hmm. in either direction. Um, you know, and that's uh, you know those that's based on um, traffic standards main, maintained by the federal government and the state. So these we aren't cherry picking. These are just the numbers that we're getting out there. Um, that isn't to say that there aren't cars. You know, and, and people have asked me, well, but there's more cars than that, and there absolutely mm -hmm. are. It is just that during those main uh, periods of of travel where everybody else is probably traveling, the only incremental the incremental cars mm -hmm. are in the range of one per minute. Um, you know, on a Saturday morning at 9 a.m., yeah, there'll be people leaving the park. And, and again, these are estimates you don't know because a lot of it's going to depend on the mix of people that you get into into your project. You know, who, who owns cars? Do people have to actually have to go to work every day? Do they work from home? Are they retired? I mean, we don't know. Okay, don't but, know, but, right. but, but the numbers are based on the best demographic projections that, that your folks can make at the time? Yeah, and, and the consultants look at the types of assets we're building and those okay. demographics, mm -hmm. and, and that's where they extrapolate likely right. car okay. ownership. Um, you know, needless to say, uh, and, and importantly, um, the numbers were derived based on pre-COVID traffic levels because, uh, needless to Very say, the, important. Last, the last two years Very would important. not be representative. Yeah, right. um, I will say that what we've seen on our other properties that we've built uh, and managed is that you know the world has been steadily changing mm -hmm. uh, we find ourselves building more uh, even again pre-covid more um, small office suites and cubicles and meeting rooms on the property mm -hmm. and that's because there's demand for that we've we already had more of our residents staying working from home or maybe working one or two mm -hmm. days from home or maybe working from ho from home from 8 to 10 and then going to an office from 10 to 4 mm -hmm. 10 to 2 so um, the traffic patterns are probably really in flux right now, and they probably will be for some time. The world has become accustomed to a different way of mm -hmm. operating, and you know, will it will it um, retract? It, it probably a little bit, but it probably won't retract all the way. But I and I think that's probably accurate. I, but I think the main point to make is because people immediately equate the number of units and people with cars and so forth, and the answer is. Uh, you have 350 or so units, uh, not everybody's going to get in their car and drive out at the same time. So exactly. we have to keep that in mind. And generally speaking, I understand the, the concern, but that's usually how it works out. And for example, the Grist Mill uh, project in the center, we have not seen the 
traffic impact that a lot of people were concerned would be, be precisely because not everybody gets in their car and leaves right. at the same time. So one other thing that is of concern is the uh, sewer situation. We have a situation in town where we're very close to our capacity for uh, sewer processing from the city of Lowell. So how are you going to address that? So um, w we were aware of the moratorium uh, when we were mm -hmm. walking into this project. Uh, we will be building a private wastewater treatment plant. Uh, that was also uh, a, an issue that came up amongst the neighbors and in the abutters. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that mean? You know, what does it look like? Yeah. Does it smell? Does it so have right. sounds? All that. All, all really good and reasonable questions. Um, the, the consultants that we've engaged have built a couple hundred of these throughout Eastern Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Um, it's not their first rodeo. It won't be their last rodeo. They really know how to do this. One of the things I thought was really interesting um, was even when we were in public meetings and kind of showing photos of what the plants are, it, it's just very hard to get your arms around what that, what that mm -hmm. means. What is that? And what we actually did was we shared a list of some uh, facilities in abutting communities, Westford, Littleton, Groton, Acton, uh, maybe not abutting, but close. And we said, hey, here, here's a plant in this, in this development, in this commercial development or this residential development. Drive by it, see, see what you mm -hmm. see. And and people did it, you know. Good, and, good. And, and and I will tell you, it was it was kind of fun to have people come up to me and say, "Oh my God, I drove by that facility, and it looks like it's a barn, and you can't hear." Didn't it. even and know it was a sewer you, treatment you plant. Wouldn't really know it's a sewage treatment plant, <laughs> right, right? You know, which you know. So when you hear that, I think people think of these open water systems. Oh, I understand. You know, yep. systems. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is it's quiet, it's contained, and you know, one of the one of the comments I made to people, which um, I don't I don't know if it helped, but um, originally we had the plant located about 150 150 ish feet off the lot line, and so there were some residents, uh, some abutters who were like, "Gee, that feels close," and I'm really worried about it. And we said, "I we understand that." Um, we moved it, we moved it another 40 feet away from them. So they're, they're, it's quite a good distance. But I'd say that nonetheless, we're 80 feet from one of our structures. Mm -hmm. And I, I, if I didn't really believe that this was a good system, I, I wouldn't have it near my structures because I wouldn't be able to rent my units. So you know, we are in alignment on, on mm -hmm. the concerns. We can't have it be unpleasant either because it would really adversely impact mm -hmm. our performance. And I think uh, I think you've you've handled that uh, about as well as it can be handled, um, and that's going to be a factor in any other projects that come into town as well. We have uh, about a minute and a half left, Mark. So what I'd like you to do is uh, uh, two things. If there's anything you want to say very briefly uh, that we may not have touched upon, and also give out your contact information so that if people watching the show have any concerns they can reach out to you and have those addressed as well. Sure, that's great. Um, well, I, I think I mentioned it earlier, but yeah, I, if anybody has any questions, concerns, comments, if I haven't spoken with you, if I've spoken with you 10, 20 times, please don't hesitate to email me. Probably the easiest way to email is mbaransky, M-B-A-R-A-N-S-K-I, at tcr.com. That, that goes to my phone, my computer, it goes everywhere. And I will respond quickly. Um, one minute. <laughs> as, yeah, as, uh, you know, uh, as I said, this has been an iterative process with the with our neighbors and with the town. Um, change is always kind of scary. Um, it can be intimidating. Um, you know, what's interesting is when we talk about traffic, the Glenview restaurant probably created a lot more traffic, mm -hmm. relatively speaking, than we're going to create. And, and it, it's not there, so I think people forgot about that. Um, those buildings, you know, when it was UMass Lowell's campus, it created traffic. And I don't think we're going to be doing terribly, terribly much more than that. Um, the process has been great. Um, we continue to work with people to make sure that we're um, maintaining their homes, maintaining their communities, maintaining their presence, giving them an opportunity. We're very excited to explore um, a, a conservation restriction on the wetlands. Um, we think that is a really wonderful way to use that land and create something great for not just, um, not just you know, the immediate community and neighbors, but certainly the broader community and, and also the, the wildlife that, that mm -hmm. travels through the town. And we're out of time, and thank you very much, Mark. Thank you.